I'll start by saying that my view of God has changed so much as I've gone on this journey. And growing up, I, I think I had a what I would call sort of a, a traditional uh, image of God. And some people jokingly will say that it's the the sky daddy <laughs> uh, vision of God or idea of God. You know, this this parental figure um, looking down on us from the heavens. Um, and that you know that changed and nuanced even when I was still actively a part of the church. Uh, but now I, I have a much more expansive view, I think, of what God, of what God is, and God for me is very much. I would prefer to, you know, say the divine, right? The divine presence is, um, is in me, is in you, is in everyone, but it, in everything, but is most especially in our relationships with each other and in our in our relationality our communities dynamic biblical discussions with special guests exploring tough biblical issues academic scholarship ethics archaeology textual criticism old testament new testament bible interpretation apocalyptic literature christian history ancient near east cultures you're tuned in to conversations with pastor cliff on poluso ministries Good day, everybody. Welcome back to another episode on Conversations with Pastor Cliff. And today I have a lovely guest, and uh, their name is Eddie Pazinski. Uh, and I know uh, Eddie from uh, Union Theological Seminary. Eddie, welcome to Conversations with Pastor Cliff. Thank you so much for having me, Pastor Cliff. I'm I'm truly honored. It's very exciting to be here. Thank you. Um, I know you and I are going to have a you know a super uh, conversation. And we've chatted about a whole lot of these things we're going to talk about today. But before we jump into our conversation, I would like to just to familiarize our audience with uh, who you are. I'll just read your bio, just to give them a bit of a background of what you have done and why we'll, we'll be talking about what we're talking about today. Okay. So Eddie is a seminary um, trained writer and scholar, educator, theologian and therapist, and a podcast creator who works at an intersection of theology education, religious diversity, social justice. They have studied religion and spiritual spirituality in Muslim, uh, Jewish, and Christian context in Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and the United States. Eddie has a BA in Biblical Min uh, Ministry Studies from uh, Weinberg University and a Master's of Arts in Interreligious um, Engagement from Union Theological Seminary. and. Uh, he also has a Master of uh, Sacred Theology from Union Theological Seminary. They currently work as a community therapist and a nonprofit agency in southern western Pennsylvania, and freelance as a as a as a as a writer, private for Private Day Plus consultant specializing in religious diversity and a podcast creator. Eddie, this is a handful what you, <laughs> what you have been doing, and uh, I certainly hope I'm going to be able to pick your brains on some of these things that you have gone on to do. Uh, perhaps as a, as a segue, just to, you know, familiarize our audience with your work, you know, can you probably share your journey, your personal journey with us, how you, you discovered, you know, embracing multiple callings and how did you, you navigate the process of basically descending these callings and finding uh, your purpose in your journey? Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's always a little strange to hear someone list out, you know, all of your qualifications in your life, but it, it, it you did such a great job. And um, yeah, I, I can share that um, my, my story uh, has been many years in the making in terms of embracing multiple callings. Uh, just to give some background on who I am, I grew up in uh, Pennsylvania here in the so-called United States. Um, and I lived and currently still live in a very rural community. Um, and I grew up in um, the Evangelical Christian Church, specifically the Southern Baptist Church, and also spent some time in an Evangelical uh, Presbyterian Church as well. Um, but I had a very strong spirituality as a child and a very deep connection with earth and with land that unfortunately I, I think I lost a bit as I grew. Um, and I was, you know, living and working in a very religiously conservative environment. And I, I went to college and was able to, for the first time, 
study other Christian theologies that I had not been exposed to. And I had had so many questions about myself and about the world, about the Bible, about God. And um, I think that going to college and being able to study Bible and ministry, religion, theology was a very defining experience for me. I got to study abroad um, and I went on to graduate school where I did more studies in interreligious engagement and comparative theology and social justice. Um, and that experience of being able to study theology from a progressive perspective was extremely instrumental for me as well. I was able to learn with Dr. John Tatominal, who I know you've had on your show already and who we've studied with together. I was able to study with a number of different professors who helped me to see that there are more options than the limited options that I was provided with growing up. So for example, in 2021, I was in between my two master's degrees. I'd had a baby, but I decided to audit Dr. Tatominal's double belonging course, which you took at a later date. And that's how we met because I was helping him teach the course. Um, but years before that, I was actually in the course as a student. And it was through that experience that I realized that it's possible to be multiple, that we, I think we have a a great responsibility to acknowledge and celebrate um, the multiplicity of who we are and the diversity that we hold even as individuals. And the way that this showed up for me while I took this course is in terms of spirituality, but also in terms of my gender. So I was able to study in that course and realize that um, not only am I spiritually multiple, drawing from Christianity, but also from earth-based traditions um, and uh, being an interreligious learner. But I'm also a multi-gender person who experiences gender very fluidly uh, and who um, I, I often say that uh, people, people see me as um, a woman and so I know what it feels like to be treated as a woman but I don't know what it feels like to feel like a woman, if that makes sense. I don't have that experience. So um, just taking that class, had I had so many profound experiences um, learning about myself and learning about others. And I was able to start my podcast called To Be Multiple, exploring multiple spiritual, spiritual and religious identities. Um, and that was... I think that's kind of the major starting point of my emphasis on um, multiple callings and multiplicity. Um, I, in terms of sort of career and the work that I'm doing, uh, I've done many different things and I'm sort of just embracing that there isn't, for most people, there doesn't seem to be a, a through line of what I'm doing <laughs> when they look at my work. Um, but I, yeah, I, I can say more as we go along, but I think that I've learned that I don't have to put myself into any particular box. Um, I don't have to try to be just one thing because I know that I'm more than that. Um, and that's something that I that I carry with me in all of my work that is very, that's a deep part of the work that I do now as a community-based therapist in my community um, and my work as a writer. I'm not in academia right now, but I... I love to write and I love to study and research. So um, I'm also a parent. I'm a single parent to a small child. So just lots of themes of, of holding multiplicity in my life and sort of a fascination for me. So I'm sure we'll have lots lots there to talk about, but that's sort of a basic introduction. <laughs> that's a very good intro, intro Alpez. Um, tell me now, um, you, you talk about these F-based uh, uh, religions. So if, if someone yeah. doesn't, understand what mm -hmm. that is Could you maybe flesh it out a little bit to to familiarize our audience as to what that is absolutely yeah that's a great question so um it's saying that something is an earth-based tradition is it's quite a broad term um, there are a lot of different religious and spiritual and cultural experiences that i think we could include in that category um but for me uh i you know i'm a white-bodied person uh a settler on um in historically indigenous lands here uh, in the U.S. And so um, 
when I'm talking about earth-based traditions for myself, I'm talking about an effort to reclaim traditions that perhaps my ancestors would have used to connect with earth and land, to honor the elements, the seasons, um, the lunar cycles, and to be more and more in tune with what's happening in, you know, what we, we might call the natural world. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by organized religion, but I don't currently, I'm not currently a member of a church uh, or any kind of community um, outside of sort of, you know, this great ne network of spiritual people that I have, but I don't have um, sort of a spiritual community here, I would say, where I live. Um, and I'm much more focused on being in touch with the land and, and finding um, connection to other people through that and through the earth, passing that on to my child. I very much think of it as a, a decolonial practice as well. So um, what I mean by that is that, um, you know, we could have a whole conversation just about this, but um, because of my particular heritage and the what's been passed along to me um, is a very sort of whitewashed and um, assimilated spirituality and religious uh, perspective. I don't know what my ancestors would have believed or practiced or how they connected with earth, but I'm very committed to doing the work of trying to restore that connection. I think that's a really critical piece of decolonizing um, and moving away from sort of Western colonial paradigms, but uh, sort of breaking that up a little bit and um, yeah, being more in tune with uh, with nature, which I believe I'm a part of. I believe we're all a part of. Humans aren't exempt from that. So yeah, does that help a little bit to flesh that out? I think it does. Uh, uh, Pez, uh, uh, it, it, it's very helpful. And you, you bring something up that is quite intriguing as well, um, that uh, these binary categories that, you know, a lot of people may identify with in the modern day thinking may not necessarily be helpful and uh, i'd like you to probably maybe weigh in on that in, in terms of you not mm. into these neatly uh constructed categories that people may want to define once as spirituality and the way they practice um their faith and i mean you point out um, in, your, in your answer that you you inherited this whitewashed um religiosity which you kind of don't know what, how it would have been practiced by your ancestors and how does that shape where you are? Because I'm, I'm of the view as well that religion is not necessarily anything that is static. Um, it kind of evolves and embraces other religions as it comes into contact with other those other religions. And it, it, it actually develops into something that it actually was not in the first place. So how do we then, um, you know, run away from these neatly cut categories, um, and mm. at the same time be able to um, to 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 make sense of what we what we, what people are doing and what we are doing ourselves. Yeah. Oh, it's a great question. Um, yeah, thank you for this. I think that um, when we're talking about binaries, and we're thinking about um, sort of. Well, I'll, I'll speak from my own experiences that um, I know that I grew up believing and still to some extent am deconstructing this idea that there is only one way, that there is um, that there is only one God, that there is only one path, that there is only one plan for my life. Um, I very much have had experiences that have helped me to deconstruct that idea and helped me to break that down a little bit. And the way that I see these binaries of, you know, either you're in or out, right? Either you're a Christian or you're not. Um, for example, um, I see these as, as coming from the position of those who are in power. Um, I think that it's, it's a way to, in a sense, to control us. It comes out of the, the sort of, um, Western intellectual tradition. And I really believe that these binaries um, serve to keep people in line. Uh, there's a very, there's a vested interest in the powers that be to um, disconnect us from our ancestors, to um, try to convince us that there's only one way of being, right? It's a kind of, I think of it as a sort of theological fascism 
that there there can only be one way. Um, and again, there's a lot to unpack here that I'm not sure I have time to unpack, but I would just say that I have stopped trying to um, intellectualize my spiritual experience and instead have focused on my experience as being a type of um, that, that it's a valid source for theology and for wisdom. Um, and that is something that I think a lot of folks struggle with. Uh, because again, we, we are not, many of us are not in tune with our bodies and our intuition. Um, many folks are very disconnected from their ancestral practices. So all of this is just to say that I think that for me, breaking down those binaries of being an insider or an outsider, the binary that, you know, you can only have one, one religion, you know, for one person um, or one spiritual path, um, that, that doesn't resonate with me anymore because I've allowed my experiences and my, my work of decolonizing myself to lead me in a different direction. Does that start to answer that question a bit? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, many people would would actually maybe be ignorant about the fact that, you know, many of us are actually multiple belongers. We may be practicing some sort of religion, whether it be Christianity or Islam or whatever faith or background one may find themselves. But that religion at that particular point in time is kind of shaped by other religions. So you may not actually know the contents of those other religions that you have influenced that religion, but it actually um, does. There's no such a thing as a as a pure uh, form of yes. religious tradition. So we actually, in a way, uh, uh, belong to multiple traditions at the same time, even though we may not think so, or maybe be ignorant about the fact. I'm not mm. too sure if you follow my, my, my way of thinking here. No, that, that makes total sense to me. And I appreciate you illuminating that point because, um, I think it brings it, it, I'm my, my sort of my brand, if you will, or the thing that I'm sort of really fascinated with is this kind of multiplicity that I think all of us have inside of ourselves that, you know, diversity and multiplicity exists between people and communities, but we also have it within ourselves as individuals. And you can, it's fascinating to think about how even on you know, a cellular level at the at the tiniest form of of matter, um, we we can go further and further that nothing can be reduced down. And there's you know so much diversity within um, our bodies and our minds. And um, you know, we're I'm not a scientist, but I, I know that you know we carry bacteria and viruses, and we have plastic in our body. All these, you know, all of these things that. Um, for me, sort of, it's it's very inspiring to think about that because I I realize that I'm carrying multitudes around with me, right? And I think that our spirits are very similar. That we don't, uh, we we feel like one person, and and maybe we are one person, but we have um, so much diversity of matter and thoughts and experiences inside of ourselves. And relating this to what you're talking about with religion. Um, absolutely that there, you know, if, if we look at Christianity, for example, Christianity, we think of as sort of this one unified movement with, you know, there, we have the Bible and there's just sort of a certain way of doing things. And maybe, you know, there's some diversity within denominations and that kind of thing. Uh, but many, I think most of us will think about Christianity as um, sort of one type of thing. But, you know, looking at Christianity historically, there's so much diversity of thought. And there is a precedent, I think, for holding multiplicity and holding that tension, right? We have four gospels about Jesus and yeah. they contra you know, they contradict each other. And yeah. and Christian theologians and thinkers have found ways to deal with that, very mm -hmm. creative and interesting ways. Um, Dr. Tatominal's book, Dr. Tatominal, who was on your show and is also, you know, a mentor and teacher of ours, um, he talks about the Trinity, uh, which is another core Christian concept, and how there's diversity even within the Godhead. And he, he, you know, um, you, every, everyone should read his book because it's very fascinating how he makes that argument. Um, yeah. So when we think about these things, I think it helps us to see that there's already a precedent for multivocality, right? This idea that there are many voices that make up our scriptures, that make up the history of Christianity, and they're often talking to each other and disagreeing, and that this is part of the process of moving forward. Um, and as individuals, I think we 
we can start to think about that as well too, that within me, I have many voices and many experiences. So, you know, I, I can be, I can be sort of in this space where I am, I'm a Christian, probably many would not <laughs> Some of the more conservative Christians would not accept me. Others, you know, other types of Christian churches might, but I'm a Christian and that I'm very passionate about scriptures and very invested in reclaiming them for social justice and for liberation. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also sort of, you know, I do sort of claim this identity of, of pagan and earth-based as well. Um, and to many people, this doesn't make sense. How can these things coexist together? Um and I, I think it is, um, I think part of the work that we have to do is moving beyond what makes sense logically uh, and embracing experience, but also there's work to be done in, in making theological arguments about this. So I know that you and I have um, had the pleasure, Pastor Cliff, of studying some of those perspectives um, mm -hmm. at Union Theological Seminary. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of really great um, work being done by emerging theologians and already established theologians about this very topic. So um, I know that it's very important for some people to to be able to um, look at the scriptures and have a really solid theological base for for this kind of experience. For me, that's not so important, but um, just so that people know, there is work being done out there about it. Mm -hmm. that's 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 true um, i mean and, and it's very complex as well so i mean i know we may be having a discussion about it and it sounds as if it's something easy to actually engage but it's actually not uh because we have all these things as trying to hedge a way for us to actually you know hold these things in tension and sometimes it's it's not so logical as people may want to to think about these things but but now um eddie i know you have a, a podcast channel called to be multiple and i, I was fascinated by it I, I mean you and i um have talked about it you know offline that you know we're doing great work on there um you. and you focus a lot on empowering individuals to live a, like a purposeful lives you know and i know Poloso ministries uh, we embrace multiple perspectives already we diving into that uh, nuanced approach uh, to whether scripture, religion, or theology, or whatever faith background that you may find yourself in. And how do you see these concepts um, of, you know, embracing this multiplicity, um, aligning with, with your mission, and also what you're trying to get out there? You spoke earlier on about social justice and trying to deconstruct some of these things mm. handed down to us or to different individuals in whatever faith tradition they may be um, located in? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, I think the importance of lifting up this these experiences of multiple religious and spiritual identities and really all forms of multiplicity, right? Um, whether that is, you know, if, if someone is biracial or multiracial, if they have multiple spiritual practices, um, if they are multi-gender, et cetera. I think that these identities are some of the most beautiful examples and powerful examples that we have of, um, of how we can, uh, I think how we can move things forward in terms of liberation for various marginalized groups of people. I think that, and this very much reflects my own sort of spiritual and, and values and ethics that, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a very vested interest in the powers that be to stifle this kind of identity because it's it very much threatens their power. And so I think it's important to magnify and lift up the stories of people who are living this way, who who are this way. Um, and I've I tried to do that on my podcast. Um, I, I've been taking a bit of a hiatus and sort of letting things um letting things flow in my life and haven't been back to the podcast for a bit. But what I, what I tried to do on my podcast, uh, at least thus far is to uh, lift up the voices of people who experience um, religion specifically and, and spirituality specifically in a multiple way. And I think what that does, it, it does a few things. I think it, it helps give other people permission to feel like they are allowed to acknowledge the ways in which they are multiple, the ways in which they carry um, sort of diverging identities within themselves. 
And I also think it speaks back to that power and gives us tools and strategies for thinking about how we can oppose power structures that use singularity, that use um, that use binaries to oppress people, right? You're either this or you're that, or you're, you know, you're out, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's very moving and inspiring work, but I also think there is a real, there are real material stakes to this as well. Uh -huh. It is dangerous for many folks to be multiple in a world where uh, singularity is is prized. Um, people are are at risk uh, at times, uh, even at risk of death. So the the stakes can be very high for this conversation. Um, and I know that when I was finally able to start the process of, of coming to terms with the ways in which I carry multiplicity inside of me, that was sort of like unlocking a key and opening a door to who I felt like I'd been for, for my, my whole life, but just didn't, couldn't, I didn't have words for it because I was in a community where that way of being was um, not understood and not valued and even talked down upon. So that's part of an answer to your question. Did I, um, I feel like I missed part of the question though. Yeah. Well, the, basically the part of the question is, um, how do we empower people to actually get mm. to a point and live uh, these purposeful lives without, you know, th these fears of being constrained, uh, by, you know, their different uh, religious uh, uh, traditions that may try and, you know, sup uh, suppress them, um, and have these singularity views uh in terms of life mm. and in terms of their spirituality in general so how do you you know push someone to that uh, level where they can you know get out of their cocoon and start to live that purposeful life that god has destined them to be did you get that uh eddie yeah it's a yes i'm, I'm remembering now <laughs> Yes. Um, it's a, it's such a good question. I mean, the way that I have tried to, to encourage people to do this is through, through the podcast, right? I think it's so important to hear that others are experiencing this. That provides a feeling of, um, permission and it helps us to feel like, um, what we are experiencing is valid too. We forget sometimes that the status quo that we live under is, is just as much experience based as any other perspective, right? Many of us are living in a world that is create has been created and dominated by cisgender, white, rich, powerful men. Mm -hmm. And that even if, you know, there's all of this messaging about how, you know, modernity has led us into this age of science and, and logic, um, all of that still comes from a very particular sort of perspective, right? And so I think it's really powerful to uplift other types of perspectives, marginalized perspectives. Um, and oftentimes, you know, those perspectives are shunned or looked down upon. Um, but it's important work, I think, in redefining how we're going to be doing spirituality and redefining um, what's possible uh, and what's, what's important for, for liberation for, for marginalized folks. So that's the work that I've done on the podcast. And I've interviewed lots of people who are spiritually multiple in a variety of different ways. Um, and I guess if I, if I had to give advice to people, I would say it, it, it's important to find people who are on this journey with you. It can be challenging. I think a, social media is a great place for these conversations. Um, and I know that my, I've tried to make my podcast a place where people can go to for resources and a starting point for finding community and finding others who are like-minded um, in the guests that I bring on um, and then the way that I talk about my own spirituality. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of living a purposeful life and stepping into our multiple callings, I think... Um, I would just go back to what I said earlier about, you know, decolonizing spirituality. It's a, it's a long process. It's difficult. I'm still, I still consider myself at the beginning of this journey of being able to hold tension, um, in, in the, in, within my own identity and within my own perspective and spirituality. It's very difficult work. Um, 
And I, I guess I would add that for me, calling is not something that I've ever had to think very deeply about because it's always been right there for me. It's something mm -hmm. that has pursued me, right? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if others experience that too, where, you know, our, I feel yeah. like what I, does that make sense? It's, it's not something that I've had to think very hard about. And no matter where I've gone or what I've tried to do, my callings and, and, who I believe I truly am, it always has a way of finding me, you know, yeah. it's, it's very persistent, right? It's, it, it comes in the forms of sort of dreams and our imaginations and our hopes and, and desires. And no matter where I've gone in the world or what I've tried to do, no matter what my career has been, no matter what turmoil I'm experiencing or the ways in which I try to distance myself from who I really am, my callings have a way of finding me. Uh, and I'm sort of at the point where I don't feel like I have any choice but to give into that and accept yeah. that and embrace that. So I don't know if that's helpful for others, but yeah, I would just encourage people to think about their callings as um, as things that that chase them, that are persistent and sort of feel almost inevitable in the sense that they're always there. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I, I would say many of us are called in different ways, um, mm -hmm. and your way may not necessarily be uh, your way, uh, but at the end of the day, you may, you know, sense that that sense of calling uh, in your life, and you have to actually uh, pursue that and see where it lands you. But uh, I believe we call uh, differently, and and it actually lends us into the next question that I wanted to to ask you, um, uh, Pez. You 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 do a lot of work, in, you know. I know you and I have kind of worked extensively, you know, offline. Um, and many people will struggle to identify with their primary calling and, and their purpose probably in life. And how then could maybe one help individuals to discern what is their calling and to mm -hmm. live a purposeful life uh, and also balance it out because we know the calling may also come with, with various challenges and nuances onto it. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm predominantly in Africa um, and I know in Africa there's a whole lot of 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 uh, differences in terms of multiplicity here mm -hmm. um you have people who come from african traditional religious background but also want to embrace christianity and 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 that as well trying to to to, to allow them to find that fit where they can express their africanness and also express mm -hmm. their roots it's also important to hold the tension um, um together and balance it out and how would you then guide someone like that who's actually struggling to make this leap um, in terms of embracing who they are, but also embracing this Christian um, mm. religion that has been handed down to them over time. To ensure that we keep bringing you tough conversations like these, please support our ministry by donating as little as 50 Rand per month. You can find our banking details on our website, pulusoministries.co.za. Mm. It's a very challenging question. Uh, and it's a good question, though, too. I don't feel particularly qualified to speak to um, your particular context, but I can speak to my own experiences and the experiences of others that I've witnessed and had the pleasure of being around. Um, and I'll, I'll perhaps just to answer the question, I'll reiterate a few of my points that I, th I really do think that calling is something that finds us. And in order to listen and in order to hear that call, we have to practice being quieter and being more intuitive with ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, there is so much noise, literal noise, but also sort of mental noise that we're inundated with today. And I think that being able to quiet ourselves and listen um, and reconnect with who we were if it's possible to do this, to connect with who we were or who we might have been before our minds were colonized, before you know the land was colonized, if we can get back to, to that place, I think we have a much better chance of understanding our callings. And you know, to be clear, I don't think that calling is just career or vocation. I, I think it has to do with what we are meant to do, what we are on earth uh, to not just to accomplish, but to experience and to be. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're able to listen to ourselves um, and to know ourselves, who we are outside of 
uh, colonization and outside of capitalism and all of these um, really oppressive structures, I think that that is a really great place to start. And it's difficult work. I think that it's best done with other people. So even though we're thinking about um, you know, our own identities. I think this is communal work. It's work that we have to do in community in order to understand each other better too. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know for folks who, in, for, for example, in, in your context, Pastor Cliff, I know that a lot of the questions are different probably from from what I'm dealing with and what I'm challenged by here. Yeah, uh, that's but, correct. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's going to be very different um, from what I'm sharing. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there's, there are, uh, there's also political work I think that has to be done in order for us to embrace our callings as well. And that's going to look different in different places. Um, I'm not an organizer, but I'm friends with organizers and very close to a lot of, um, people who are activists and, and public advocates. And I think that that is that work helps us to understand better who we are in relation to other people a lot of the time. So um, I think that there we, we sort of have to approach this from multiple different fronts. And in terms of specifically the Christian church, which I know you just mentioned, um, I really feel for people who, and, and really am passionate about speaking to people who are in the church, um, but are, are feeling called to be both in the church and, mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether it's pra to do something like practicing their ancestral traditions or engaging with other religious perspectives that speak to them, that are a part of them, um, I, I feel very passionately about speaking to that because I had my own journey and struggle with that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think it was really a process of both studying other theological views and also just... Uh, <laughs> sort of simultaneously trying to disconnect from having to think about these things so logically. Um, and so it's, it, it's a process of untangling these things that happens in multiple ways. But, um, you know, I really, I just want to acknowledge too, that I know that in your context and, and really here too, just in different ways, uh, we just can't underestimate how colonization has played a role in all of this. Um, mm -hmm in suppressing us from our ancestral traditions and from our own intuitions um, in order to benefit those in power. So I hope that starts to answer that, that question, but I, I do think that there are particular, there will be particular issues with this that are different in different places. Um, for example, we know that in certain parts of East Asia, it's, it's very normal for folks to have multiple religions yeah. that are used for a variety of occasions, um, rituals and traditions, and and people don't think anything of it because this is just culturally what is accepted. So those of us living sort of in a, under more what we might call Western paradigms, um, where either you're one thing or you're something else, you can't be both. Uh, we have particular issues with this, and it changes depending upon um, the community and you know the demographics of a certain area. Yeah, that's so, that's so true that you bring that up, uh, Eddie, uh, the whole point of Asia. Um, I know also here, where I am in South Africa, we we have other churches that uh, practice African traditional religion and also blend it with Christianity. So, yeah. And people who are in those traditions don't actually think about it as a blend, but they think about it as just a thing that they're doing. They, they, they're not thinking that they are basically double belongers or triple, you know, whatever it may be. But it is who they are it that's mm. how they express their, their tradition and um i know and something that strikes me as you as you talk you have this sense or i'm getting this sense that you know you have trusted god in how he has led you up to 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 go towards your journey in terms of um discovering yourself um and embracing multiplicity um and and tell me a lot of people i know they struggle uh, with this uh, particularly on their journeys um, trying to embrace um, and fulfill this multiple multiplicity that they may feel a sense of calling um, towards. And how would you maybe um, advise someone to actually trust in God and, and trust the mm -hmm. process um, and, and just take whatever religion or religions at whatever they bring, not trying to make some logical sense uh, into... Because 
you know, taking a religion on, on its own, like Christianity or African traditional religion, not trying to match it up and try and make it compatible with what you probably may have learned in Christian theology, because that you may not actually click um, at all times. You know, I mean, we've discovered this when we were actually uh, doing a course in double belonging. So uh, how, what, mm. what would you say to someone uh, who finds themselves mm. in that uh, probably uh, predicament that some people would look at it that way, but I, I see it as a process of growth. Mm. Mm, it's a great question. Um, I, I guess I, I'll start by saying that my view of God has changed so much as I've gone on this journey. And growing up, I, I think I had a what I would call sort of a, a traditional uh, image of God. And some people jokingly will say that it's the the sky daddy <laughs> uh, vision of God or idea of God. You know, this this parental figure um, looking down on us from the heavens. Um, and that, you know, that changed and nuanced even when I was still actively a part of the church. Uh, but now I, I have a much more expansive view, I think, of what God, of what God is. And God for me is very much, I would prefer to, you know, say the divine, right? The divine presence is, um, is in me, is in you, is in everyone, but it, in everything, but is most especially in our relationships with each other and in our in our relationality our communities that's where i see divine presence um and for folks you know who are struggling to make sense of their multiple callings or their multiple identities um who are christian or feel very connected to god i think a a great thing to to think about and to study and just to to meditate on again not to over intellectualize but just to to meditate upon this idea of looking at how how different God is throughout the entire Bible. I think that's a fascinating place to begin. Um, the again, this idea of multivocality that um, there are so many so many voices of God and God takes on so many characters, if you, if you will, in in the Bible and the way that God is presented. I find that really fascinating and it's not really, something that was taught to me when I was young. In fact, I think um, there was a huge push in my churches growing up to, um, you know, to define God as being unchanging and, you know, all, all of these other sort of um, big words that we we throw around. I'm, I'm forgetting them now, you know, um, omniscient and omnipotent, right? Um, yeah. And, and you know, what's that? Those words you can't actually find them in the Bible. Is it <laughs> They're much? not in the Bible. Okay. No, and and certainly there are parts where God maybe seems to be that way. But then you know God is a still small voice, and God is um, you know incarnate in Jesus. Uh, and and it even I mean Jesus, you know, again so going back to the four Gospels, who who is Jesus? Jesus is there's all these diverse ways of expressing who Jesus was, and of course there are through lines, right? There are there are commonalities between um between you know the the books of the bible and how god is portrayed but i think that's a really interesting place for people to start is to meditate on the diversity of of god in the trinity and the way that god is um portrayed throughout throughout the bible um and again i think that some some people might feel very uncomfortable with that or threatened by that because of this push to define god as being this sort of singular deity up in the clouds or in the heavens. Um, but I think when we start to see God as being more expansive and, and God, God in matter, right. God in the world, that really changes how we interact with each other, how we value life, how we, um, how we think about even what we would call non-life, right. How we think about the earth and the, the rocks and the trees and, um, things that are alive and things that are um, non-living, it changes how we want to show up. At least it does for me, right? It changes how I want to interact on a day-to-day -day basis with the people in my life and with um, the earth and the land around me. So uh, yeah, I would start there to, to, to start to reimagine God is, I think, part of this decolonizing work um, of, of, stripping back sort of all of this this messaging that we've been receiving and being able to um to see who we are outside of that and to see god outside of that 
is very difficult work, but I think it's important. Um, so I hope that that's a helpful place for some people to start. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a very good place to start. I mean, you mentioned that the, the, the Bible, both Testaments, you know, the Hebrew Bible and the Greek text, will probably, they have so many nuances in them about who God is. Um, you know, com some in, in most cases you have competing ideas about, you know, how people perceive God in different generations. And you have all those intersectionalities playing out in the, in the whole, you know, Bible. It's not even a book, it's, you know, it's just the collection no. of literature um, that people don't realize when they're handling the, this uh, massive collection of literature that you're dealing with competing ideas and you have multiple traditions that are actually happening within the biblical text itself so already we're talking about multiple belonging in the biblical yeah. text already. Mm -hmm. so there's no way to actually run away from it but now mm. you say to someone who's actually struggling with this whole concept you know in your experience how um you know there, there are misconceptions of course that people may have and obstacles that may, may come their way and and they may encounter as they try and you know start this journey and and walk towards this um a journey of embracing multiplicity so what would you say to to someone like that who's, in, who's wanting to start the mm. journey of multiplicity and and how to overcome some of these challenges that may confront mm. them as they they go on this journey oh it's a great question um and I wish that someone had given me advice <laughs> in in my early days along my journey because it can be a very lonely and painful journey. And for that reason, I think it's just imperative that people find community to do this with, whether it's people online or um, people in your community, your local community, physical community who are on similar journeys. I think it's very important. And I, you know, I have very dear friends who I, I do this work with. Um, and I've continued to do some of this work um, of thinking about this and and trying to embrace multiple callings at at in seminary as well. So I think that's a first step. Um, I, I really think that the rest is a lot about having a lot of patience with yourself and being very you, you can be very slow with this process because you know, this is a process of untangling all of these messages that we've received that shape who we are. And so I think we have to be, we have to tell people that, you know, it's okay that this is scary. It is okay that this is hard work. Um, mm -hmm. I would expect it to be hard work given the world in which we're living. So yeah, I think finding other people to walk with on this journey is very important. Um, I think it's important to, to surround yourself with books and videos and learning that will enrich how you're starting to think about um, being multiple, um, and really, especially tuning into those marginalized perspectives, um, and finding, uh, finding solace there, you know, finding commonalities there, um, and just giving yourself the opportunity to be nurtured by people who are further along the path. Um, but it, 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 and, you know, I'll say to anyone who's listening, who is on this journey right now, it's very difficult, um, but it does get better and it gets it. I know that in terms of all of my multiplicities, there are still days when I, I feel tension and I feel I, I sort of call it. Um, it's it's almost like society is gaslighting you. Right. <laughs> um, for, you know, for example, I'm I'm called, you know, people will often profile me as a woman or call me she, her pronouns, use she, her pronouns for me pretty much every day. And it's something that I'm used to. But even that small example shows that, you know, sometimes I internalize that and I think, wait a minute, am I, you know, <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> am I wrong about this whole thing? Everybody sees me this way and everyone else is on this, on this different track. Not everybody, but a lot of other people are on this other it's like they're living in this different world. Am I the one who's delusional? Uh, and and that can happen with spirituality too, right? We step into a church and and we're told, you know, there's only one particular way of being and only one particular way of being a Christian and of walking Jesus' path. And and we start to think, well, you know, is there something wrong with me? <laughs> right. Is what's, am I, are my perspectives and experiences here really valid? So I think we have to resist that gaslighting as much as possible. And that starts in by being supported by others 
and and learning about ourselves more deeply and doing that decolonial work of really listening to our intuitions and and trusting trusting that we you know I, I like to say that my my body and my experience is a source of wisdom I think we each have a source of wisdom in our own experiences and each of us is an expert on our own bodies and and the way that our bodies have moved through the world the way that our experiences shape us we are experts on ourselves right we know best so don't let anyone tell you otherwise you do know best about who you are um, and that's something that you can explore in community as well so i hope that's helpful for folks yeah i think that's very helpful already you mentioned something quite profound that you know i actually want to ask you about it before i let you go since we we're pretty much running out of time um you talked about god as someone who's actually changing and i, I kind of mm. have the same view uh, because a lot of people come from you know maybe a christian background or whatever faith background they may not think so uh, because they think god is this guy who's just you know confined and he looks like this and he's just up there you know they have a different concept about who god is and i'm of the view that he's way advanced you know he's you know than we are and we are basically evolving and trying to catch up to this god and we actually never quite catch up but we do a good best to actually try and catch up and in our catching up we we evolve into all sorts of things and i think if we can evolve you know how much more about god you know maybe to think mm -hmm. of him a guy who just sits up there and not you know evolving at all that's a little bit upset i i, I would think and you you, you kind of coined it when you say People must just um, go on this journey and evolve and mm -hmm. and 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 grow and educate themselves. And it gets easier, but it's not easy. But it gets easier as time goes. And I don't know if the, those are your sentiments that you know people must just hang in there and embrace you know their experience, embrace uh, their tradition, and embrace uh, who they are, and embrace this multiplicity, yeah. this beauty, this beauty in that. Mm. I yes, I do. I I fully agree. I and it's it's hard because you know it. It's easy for me to just say, well, you know, just let go and let it happen. But it's you know it's very difficult, and I know that from experience that it is very challenging. Um, it's challenging and it's work, right? It does take intentional work, I think, to allow it to happen. Um, but it, you know, I know I've gotten to a point where I'm able to find a lot more confidence and a lot more certainty in who I am by being able to, you know, I don't use this word very often, but there is a kind of surrender. I think that happens where, um, you know, I mentioned before, it feels like my callings have chased me. It feels like I'm constantly being pursued by these things, many more things than just what I shared here today. They're, they're, they're finding me, right. It's, it's a kind of, um, I would I would sort of call it destiny. I don't know if, if people use that word to mean what I mean by that, but um it's it's not that something will happen for sure. It's it's that it's something that is meant to happen. And that I know that maybe it doesn't sound like there's a distinction there, but I just know I think very intuitively what I'm supposed to be doing and who I am. And as when I've tried to stifle that, it has always come back to find me no matter what. And yeah. so I think that if we're able to tune into those things that that are sort of in pers relentless pursuit of us that we keep coming back to that we know we're supposed to surrender to and give into I think there's there's a peace that comes with that um mm -hmm. and this is just this is kind of a newer idea that I'm sharing with you now about this whole thing but it it newer for me uh but it feels it feels important to share with people um and I, I try to encourage people to really to, to listen to themselves and to, to step into that intuition. Um, and I know that that's even just talking about that many people are scared by that too. It's, it's scary trusting our bodies and trusting our experiences because we've been taught to do exactly the opposite, right? You know, growing up, I learned that, um, you know, that my, that the flesh, right, that my body is is wicked and evil and that I can't trust what I feel. Uh, and, and now I believe co co quite the opposite, which is that um, I am only satisfied and fulfilled spiritually when I give in and surrender to 
the experiences of my body and the experiences of um, of my intuition and and what I bring to the world. So, uh, yeah, again, it's difficult work, but I yep. want to encourage people to to explore it um, in in whatever way makes sense for them, where wherever they are on the journey. Yeah, I think that that that's you you hit the nail. I mean, I had a guest last week uh, that I went to seminary with, and uh, uh, for for many years, he, you know, I didn't he didn't tell me what 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 he embraces or, or, or who he is, but mm -hmm. he then later told me then that he's queer. I'm like, oh man, that's wonderful. So I had him in the sh on the show um, last week actually, and he actually said, "This is what I feel, and this is what I this is who I am." I said, "Well, that's who you are. You know, that's that's, and I'm happy. You know, embrace who you are. Embrace who you are." Mm -hmm. So basically, Paz, I'm saying thank you in a way that you are living up to who you are and you're embracing your multiplicity and you're helping a lot of people in your uh, in your podcast by the way um, um I, I certainly listen to a, a whole lot of those interviews you have, you have on your podcast and very enriching very insightful and very educational so i, I thank you for that um perhaps before i let you go pez um you know i know i've been mentioning this podcast do you want to share with our audience how to you know get hold mm. of this podcast and if there's any other online presence that you may want mm. uh, to get uh, in touch uh, with you or maybe some of your resources, you know, maybe you can direct us where to go. Absolutely. Th and thank you so much for having me, Pastor Cliff. This was so, so enjoyable. And as I told you before we started recording, this is my first guest appearance on someone else's podcast. So it's uh, quite an honor that it that my first time was on your podcast. Um, if folks would like to, to follow me um, and the podcast online, feel free to connect on Instagram at called to be multiple podcast. Um, you can find the podcast on most streaming services. Um, just type in called to be multiple. Um, uh, you could even just do a, you know, a browser search and it should come up uh, towards the top. Um, and uh, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty much all. I, I think if I may add a final thought, I would just leave people with um, this thought that um, I think we're living in a world right now where talking about diversity and talking about multiplicity is feels a little bit corporate sometimes, right? <laughs> it's kind of like a, a feel good thing that we talk about. Um, but you know, the, I think the stakes here are, are so high and so important and uh, it's not just about becoming, you know, our true selves, although that's important. It's also about resisting oppression and, and fighting for liberation. And I really believe that we're only able to do that when we see ourselves clearly and when we resist in ways that challenge the status quo. And being multiple is one of those ways. So that's part of why it's such hard work, but also really important work. So um, if you'd like to connect with me further, I am always very open to talking with people about about these themes and these topics um, and, you know, love to receive emails and love to talk with folks further about their own individual journeys um, and what they're going through. So feel free to send me an email as well. It's just my first and last name at gmail.com, A-D-D-I-E-P-A-Z-Z-Y-N-S-K-I at gmail.com. I would love to hear from folks if they'd like to share. Oh, great. That's fantastic, uh, Pez. Um, I've enjoyed it. Um, and I'll definitely also be in touch with you, as we always do talk on the side. Yes. Um, and folks at home, I certainly hope you've uh, enjoyed this conversation and you've learned a lot. And, uh, you know, you can begin by embracing that multiplicity that you've been, you know, feeling and experiencing for a long time. So I, I guess this is the time to do it. Until next time, folks, uh, stay blessed and God bless you. Thank you. Poloso Ministries is a non-profit educational enterprise founded in 2019. The ministry is informed by academic scholarship. At Poloso, we embrace multiple perspectives in our engagement with scripture. We seek to provide non-Christians and Christians from all backgrounds and denominations with resources that provide an honest intellectual engagement with the Bible. We embrace multiple perspectives in fostering a more open, moderate society into the 21st century and beyond.